Hello, everyone, and welcome to Integrated Rhythm, two swing dancing besties navigating race and the black experience in jazz dance and other Afrocentric dances. Uh, your hosts are Chisomo Selamani and Bobby White, and this is one of our first episodes that we recorded together. This is just a conversation with Chisomo and I, and uh, it's interesting to look back and hear it and hear how even just over the last few months since this was recorded, my understanding uh, and the way that I view things has grown and changed, and so I would have not made certain assumptions, and I would have framed questions in slightly different ways. So it's just fascinating to look back over that, and as Chisomo uh, is constantly reminding us, it's an imperfect journey, and that's okay. So we hope you enjoy this early episode of Integrated Rhythm. Integrated Rhythm with Chisomo and Bobby. All right, welcome to Integrated Rhythm, two swing dancing besties navigating the world of Afrocentric social dancing. I'm Bobby. And I am Chisomo. And for this episode, we're just going to, just Chisomo and I are going to talk, and we're going to talk about something that uh, I just think is so important for all of this stuff. And I got, I got it from reading... Um, do, 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 I should have been more prepared. Ah, ah, I got this. Hey. I got this. Hey, 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 ah. All right. I got this from reading, uh, stamped from the beginning. Ibram X. God, my Kindle keeps cutting it away. Oh my, just show me the title. Ibram X. Kendi. I I also don't know if I'm saying that correct. I really should have researched his well, name. Well, he is also the, he's the author of How to Be an Anti-Racist, right? So yeah. he's done a lot of wonderful work. So anyway, so stamped from the beginning. Yeah, and in the introduction, uh, uh, he talks about how you can frame a lot of American, Americans' racism history, and I'll use my words, uh, you can frame them in two different ways. You can frame them as, as like skin color racism or like, you know, biological racism, like people of this skin color are objectively inferior kind of thing. Uh, but the other kind of racism is an assimilationist racism, as he puts it. Mm -hmm. And that is uh, the culture of, mm. of, of these people are is objectively inferior to the culture of like white European people is, is obviously what, what was going on in this specific instance. And so uh, when that happened, it was one of those things where I had to put the book down and go and just process that and be with, with thoughts and feelings for a while, because that just really just kind of really beautifully put so many things that, that have gone on that I, that I, you know, think about in the past or in the present happening now. And so what we have is we have, uh, I think that genetic racism is very, very low, for instance, in like the swing dance scene. I, 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 I don't hear of a lot of people walking around saying like black people are obviously genetically inferior to white people. However, I, I would assume, and correct me if I'm wrong, that there's probably quite a lot of either conscious or subconscious uh, assimilationist racism, like black culture is something that white people don't understand or they think is not, you know, is, 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 has some differences with white culture. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's the kind of basic idea. Yeah, yeah. So first of all, I think that it's brilliant that you... Um, uh, pulled reference from Ibram Kendi because he has his body of work is just absolutely impressive and I would encourage anyone to um, research his work and to study the the words that he's put together because he's he has a lot of great resources um, I I would say that there are aspects of 
both kinds present in the swing dancing scene. I think if we were uh, recognizing that the swing dancing scene is um, a microcosm of the bigger of greater society, um, I would say that I think as a society, as the U.S., we've gotten past like um, our uh, people. People aren't necessarily going to immediately state rude comments to people who are darker skinned. Um, there are places where that still happens, but I think that as a society, there are, there are a lot of behaviors that have changed. So, so it seems like there isn't as much conflict just with the way a person appears. Um, but I, but I do think that we have incorporated a lot of stereotypes and ideas about what a person with darker skin can do and what what they're what they should do. Um, uh, you know that like one of my favorite books is Whistling Vivaldi because it talks about the internalized stereotypes that many people have and the harm that comes from that. So I do think that there is like a, I, I don't want to say that there, there isn't that like um, you are darker skin, so therefore you're not capable because I mean, there's also still like all kinds of things about pain and healthcare and um, assumptions about particularly black bodies. So so there's that, but I do think what you're talking about in terms of assimilationist racism is definitely there and um, people have working assumptions, right? So I know that with me being African, being from Zambia, I've kind of been on the wrong end of many conversations. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I am, I present as black, I sound, um, like what people would say, I have a general American. Um, so, so in speech pathology, we've categorized the way that, like, uh, the way that we, like Bobby, the way that you and I speak in this moment, as general American English or standard American English. I, I take up issue with standard American English because that mm. indicates that there's a standard, um, <laughs> you know. And so, yeah, that, and and if we want to get into the work of social justice, that a lot of the, much of that work is decentralizing. Um, what has been perceived to be normal, you know? And so, so anyway, so thinking about the way that I talk um, and the way that I look being dark skinned, um, I, I, I inhabit a lot of traits of, of a, of an American um, and, and like a black American at work. Right. So, <laughs> so people will talk about president Obama. Like there are a couple jokes out there about like president Obama and the way that he talks and they're like, how can we trust a man who talks like that? And um, some comedians are like, well, have you ever met a black person at work? <laughs> like, President Obama <laughs> talks like a black person at work, and so I sound because like he's always at work when you're a president. <laughs> right? Exactly. I get, you're it. Always at work. I get it. <laughs> exactly. So I sound like a black American at work, and so um, there are parts of my um, identity that are African American because regardless of where you come from, if you're in the United States and you're my complexion, you are perceived as African American. And you're treated yeah. as such. So so that's what I mean. So I'm so I yeah, there are parts yeah, I, of me that are oh, sorry? No, no, go on, go yeah. on. <laughs> there are parts of me that are African American. And then there's obviously, I mean, if you read anything about me, if you Google me, you hear all about Zambia. So I'm definitely Zambian. Um, but I like I say, I'm on the wrong end of some of these conversations because um the way that I am perceived, especially having this like general American. English situation by some of my counterparts in Zambia is as being better than because it seems like I've assimilated to a culture that is it categorically higher than another, which I take so much issue with. Um, so much issue. And then we see there are some African Americans that will see me as being a member of Zambian society and seeing that as categorically higher. And so the fact that we have this stratification of cultures, even within the Black community, to me, it's problematic because we are all, all means all, we are all worthy, we are all valid, Blackness is not a monolith we're all allowed to exist in our different iterations. But because of our internalized understanding of oppression and culture, 
we find the stratification within the black community, within black communities, I should say, and of course, across communities as well. So those are some of my thoughts. And so we see that in the swing dancing scene for sure. And so um, I have been told that because I am African, that people are more inclined to listen to me about things related related to black things. And within the swing dancing scene- Isn't that so fascinating? <laughs> <laughs> it is, it is fascinating oh, but yeah there's certain people who are deemed to be um more expert because of their cultural affiliation and so um it is frustrating because there is a particular type of black that is appropriate or whatever or deemed the most worthy but it's also i would say it's analogous to the there's a type of woman that the world tries to make women. And so <laughs> everybody loses as a result. Yeah. So anyway, I will let you talk, Bobby. <laughs> no, that's okay. This, this show is not about me talking. Uh, but it does remind me that, uh, so first off, as a, as a, it's so amazing. I'm, I'm sure, uh, as, as you just mentioned, how much speech is a part of that, how much like the, the words and the way that you say words can can make just a huge difference in in the way that people perceive you i know for like um i remember first off javier johnson amazing baboa dancer and amazing uh, great guy uh he i remember uh we we kind of grew up in the atlanta swing scene for a few years together and we would uh uh, he, we were in, he was in practices and teams we were on together and all this kind of stuff. And I got, I was really fortunate to have a lot of uh, awesome opportunities to play around with him. And, and like, he, he's so fun to bounce ideas off of. And uh, I remember uh, talking to him and uh, saying like, you know, like at Javi, I, I feel like I always, I feel like I always connected with you like from the beginning and there wasn't like, I don't know, like I just, it was really, uh, as if to say, like my experience in in these relationships was so normal that it didn't even register on my brain that like, oh yeah, Javi is a black man who has the struggles and problems that black men face every day, and I just that just didn't even like cross my mind in those years that we uh, that we were really close in Atlanta together, and and he just said, oh yeah, well because I was code switching, mm -hmm. and that also was like a mind like. <laughs> mm -hmm. And all of a sudden I was like, oh, right, right. He like, yeah. he code switched for me. And a lot of code switching is, you know, that, that changing the language and changing the way that you speak to someone like Obama at work, Yeah, I assume. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and to this day, like my brain still flips. Like, uh, so I live in um, Prospect Park Sleppard's Gardens in Brooklyn, which is a uh, Caribbean island predominant neighborhood. And my brain will still do a little somersault without me even realizing it, right? Like it's subconscious. Like I'm walking down the street and I see a person dressed, uh, you know, very much in the fashions of black Americans, especially like in, in the high school that I grew up in in Atlanta. So friends, you know, like a ball cap and like streetwear and all this kind of stuff. And in my head, I'm expecting that person to sound like the people, you know, that I grew up with in my high schools and stuff. And instead, all of a sudden, this thick, Caribbean American accent is is coming out of the conversation as I walk past them. And my brain just has that little somersault where it's like, whoa, that was not what I was expecting. Why was I expecting something? I need to think about this. Yeah. Yeah. I So I think that so much of social justice work is questioning those assumptions, you know? And so if something hits you in your gut and you're confused or you're upset or you have any kind of emotional <laughs> reaction, I think it's really important to take that and, and examine it and wonder like, where is that coming from and why, you know, and um, what's my part in this? What messages have I absorbed? And, and, and truly kind of stare at it like a science project. Cause like, as we talked about in our first episode, um, we're not about shame here, right? We're not, we're not about shame. We're, we're about growth 
and and growth is often uncomfortable um and growth growth comes out of that uh reflective moment but yeah it's we have assumptions about what's going to come out of somebody's mouth so as a as a speech pathologist um i remember i was studying under um he's a he was a really well-known um voice specialist dr hicks um in my grad school class with him he talked about how um there's so much we there's so much the voice tells us so when you hear somebody speak um it can tell us about different just tell us different things about a person right um but then as i heard him I thought about myself and my own voice and how if somebody hears me on the phone and they don't see me, there's so many assumptions that they can make about me. <laughs> and in fact, I have had many, it's so funny because like, if you get a written document from me, um, or if you get um, a, if you have a voice sample or if you see me, I've had a lot of people have a hard time piecing all three of those pieces of evidence together <laughs> and so <laughs> um actually so i i had submitted a proposal for a presentation for the eastern conference on uh, communication disability in kenya a couple years ago and um i was uh, it was accepted i was invited to chat to, to come and present and um so they just all they had was written communication and this was before i put like my pronouns in my signature so they had no idea who like what i would present as <laughs> but they made an assumption <laughs> so when i showed how, up how did that I, assumption go <laughs> people were so confused i rocked up to kenya and people were like oh you're Professor Salamani? Oh, we were <laughs> for like we were expecting a man. <laughs> so, <laughs> they thought they thought I was gonna be a man. And I was like, I'm sorry, I'm not a man. And then I have had communication <laughs> where it's just Don't ever apologize for not being a man to Somo. <laughs> I know that you're <laughs> I yeah, no, I won't I won't uh I won't apologize. I'm like, hey. That's interesting that you thought that I was a man. <laughs> we should talk about that sometime. <laughs> you can pay me to talk about that sometime. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah. And then uh, I've had people, particularly in Zambia, talk to me on the phone and then me show up and they're like, oh, we were expecting a white lady <laughs> to show up. <laughs> um, so I actually learned to code switch a lot like with my family in order to, in order to be more understood. So the way that we're speaking here is not at all how I sound when I cross the ocean. Do you mind giving us a little bit of that <laughs> crossing the ocean? Oh man, I don't know. Can I, can I I'm like, I'm, am I, I know, yeah, put yourself there mentally in the yeah, zone. Like what, what kind of things do you need to surround yourself with? <laughs> yeah, actually, so I was, a couple Did years you, ago you just get like angry at your mom isn't that like a, a <laughs> trick or something like that or <laughs> wait does, does it come out when you drink when so uh i went to uh I, so i grew up in the south went to a university in tennessee and it was hilarious how many people once they got drunk that yeah. southern draw started coming out yeah, strong it does i've actually seen that happen with people yeah they it just well because when you're relaxed and you're yeah but i I, um, when I get off the plane, there's usually like a couple, like a couple hours or a couple days transition. And so I remember talking to a good friend of mine, um, who had really only ever heard me in Zambia. And then we talked here and she was like, ah, Chisomo, your, your English, it's very, it's, it's too deep. <laughs> it's too deep. <laughs> So, so yeah. So I was like, "Oh, sorry. Let me, let me, um, let me come back to Zambia. I need to, <laughs> I need to go home." Oh. And so, so yeah. Actually, I, um, you know, I interviewed amazing author Namwali Serpo, um, and professor at Harvard. I, when I interviewed her, as one of the topics of conversation before our interview, we talked about code switching, because she, she. 
um, switches, she switches codes and she's reading her book. So she goes a little bit deeper into oh, Zambia. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so yeah, it's, it's definitely a thing. But then I also talking about these different identities, like the African American side, there's also that as well. You know, like I, I was talking to some students earlier this week and um, I was in professional mode and one of my students was like, well, I don't have too much time. I was like, nah, girl, I don't have time either. Like, I'm like, <laughs> I, I just was able to like, you know, and so there's, yeah. And I also like mixing formality with informality with my students because oh, I yeah. think it's important to model that. But, but going back to this like over arching overarching conversation about um different types of racism and thinking about the cultural pieces i i i think black as king is a really great uh kind of case study in this discussion um there's there are these notions of um kingdoms do you mind explaining what that is really quick yeah so or black is king is the body of work that um beyonce did as a collaborative effort with many uh, musicians across the continent of africa so she had um contributors i believe from south africa from ghana uh, i want to say nigeria as well and so and those if you know anything about Afrobeats, um african pop music that's coming out right now those are kind of like the the the, the hot spots so nigeria is doing some great things ghana is doing some great things south africa is doing some great things and honestly there are many countries in between so like tanzania or Tan tanzan tanzania sorry <laughs> so speaking of uh code switching right so i'm gonna go back to my my mom hates it that i call it tanzania because i picked that up while I was living in Zambia versus when I grew up because she said Tanzania. That's a dialectical difference. She says Tanzania. Um, but so Tanzania has some great artists. Um, so does the Congo. Like, so yeah. So if you're into Afrobeats, there are several centers of excellence, but going back to Beyonce, she did this collaborative work with these different from artists from all over the continent. And it has been, critiqued and disputed like there's much dispute over this um collection like so everybody agrees the music's fire <laughs> it's like, of course the music is fire but um there are a lot of problematic um ideals and ideas that are like thread through this so even the notion of kings and kingdoms like there's so many different ways to look at that so hopefully in a future episode we might have a more a greater discussion about that. Yeah, yeah, and I'm really interested. Like, uh, uh, Chisomo and I got to got to take a course from Monsell Durden, yeah. who is an amazing scholar uh, with hip hop and other Black American art forms, and he uh, he broke down a a Beyonce video, uh, and it was you know it was it was really cool to see all the things that. We're going into it and stuff and so ever I've, I've always i've had a lot of respect for beyonce and her artistic uh yeah. staff and, and it's working to like do all these awesome things and and yeah it's you know when you're beyonce and you say something like that's going to be powerful and so yeah. I, I can only imagine the amount of responsibility that she either has or, or that she does have and whether or not you know how much she feels it is her responsibility to like craft that oh yeah yeah i'm interested in talking about it yeah More yeah later. <laughs> you're you're right though there's the question about like and i think we kind of always toe this line um because we try to be particularly thoughtful individuals right like so the the line between like artistic privilege and responsibility and so um there are lots of things that have been pursued in the name of art and in creativity and like there have been some aesthetically pleasing um some generally pleasing products but then like there's some underlying ideology sorry bobby you look like you want to say something oh, no, that's, that's, yeah uh, that's fine uh, and, and yeah. It, it reminded me of you know uh whenever um there's a few comedians uh black comedians who you know like they'll do the jokes the way that they want to do them and they'll say the things they want to say yeah and then they'll get attacked being like you got you have to stand up for the culture better or like you right. can't say that because that's like against the culture and i always feel 
really sympathetic to like how they're they just they want to be an artist they want to be themselves and so many white people uh get the chance to just kind of you know the, white comedians can be of any kind of of you know opinion you know all over the board you can be a white comedian and have a, an opinion and there are people who might think that you're a jerk or offensive if they don't like your stuff but they never say whoa 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 you're supposed to be like speaking for white people yeah you should also have that burden as well you know yeah. that never happens and so like uh, that's that i that's really sad that that black artists have to have this like responsibility burden on top of everything that they do because they're almost always very small minority representing uh, a vast and and you know great culture of of lots of rich different ideas yeah so i completely hear you on that i think it's it's interesting because there's um i'm sorry i was having a fly moment um which makes me feel a little bit uncomfortable a little uncomfortable so i will just by the way this was recorded three days after the uh, vice presidential debate <laughs> yeah just a few days after that moment vice presidential debate 2020 uh anyway so um i'm not going to if you are curious about what that means go ahead and google it there was a uh, u.s vice presidential debate 2020 fly I, that's all i'm going to say don't need to get into it but um so I was squatting it might be the only thing you've heard about the debate <laughs> that might be exactly depending on where you are um so i i might have just distracted myself too much so much that i didn't have can't remember if Hey everybody, this is Bobby White from Integrated Rhythm. We're here to ask you to please consider donating to the podcast. You can do so by going to patreon.com slash integrated rhythm. You can do so by Venmoing at Bobby Swungover. And make sure to put a little IR in the note so we make sure it goes to the right people. You can also do so by PayPaling at Bobby White 3. And once again, putting a little IR in the in the window there. Doing so will help us keep this podcast going, and we love doing it, and we hope you love it too. If you can't afford to donate at this time because times are rough, we totally understand. We don't want you to put yourselves out. We want you to keep enjoying the podcast for free. However, if you have a little bit of pocket change in your pocket, we would greatly, greatly, greatly appreciate it. Thanks, and have a great day. So um, there's a burden that many... Um, particularly people from minoritized perspectives have. When you are one of few, it is often incumbent upon you to represent your people, which if you think about is, is so unfair. Um, anyone who has been like the only, uh, only person of color in a classroom, like, has had that moment where an instructor is talking about like i i had a moment and god bless him truly i loved my english lit teacher in high school i loved him oh no it's gonna be um, english lit. But, oh, but no. i mean i i had to like inform the pronunciation of some words that were like from a, a west african context so i could roundabout gets like so i had to read to certain passages from this african book and so i mean it was because i was the african in the room right and so at that point in time it didn't seem problematic to me and i was ultimately you know you get through like my angelou says like when you know better you do better and so we're always striving <laughs> <laughs> but but like here's the thing though is like if you are from a minoritized perspective oftentimes you're asked to represent either explicitly or it's an implicit expectation um but that's un that's unfair like you said to speak plainly and i'm sorry if this is offensive but like oftentimes white people are allowed to stand for themselves so if we look at a white person that does something that nobody likes or very few people like they're like oh well that person that per yeah. there's something wrong. Yeah, they're just, they're just, yeah. There's... Who, sorry, Bobby? No, I was, I was, I was agreeing with you. I was playing along with the. Yeah, yeah you're like that. I got, that I, got I got physically involved in in, in the discussion. <laughs> I appreciate it. That person, that that individual, 
did something wrong. But um, oftentimes, if it is a person from a minoritized perspective, then it's like, well, you know how blank people do. I mean, I've been... I've been holding back. I really want to, we have another segment where we'll probably talk a little bit more about Kamala Harris, but like there's, I've seen a lot of a commentary about, about black women with Kamala Harris. So once again, right. So like Pence is able to be Pence and he, it's like, oh, well, Pence is disruptive. Not all white men are disruptive, but Kamala Harris, like I hate it when black women are smug or like black women, this black women, that, you know, like, yeah. And, uh, you know, there's the, oh man, it made me so frustrated when I saw like, uh, in some of the social media feeds, people being like, what, when you hear good intentioned, well-intentioned, good intentioned, well-intentioned. It's all good. <laughs> when you hear it's all good intentioned people, uh, <laughs> trying to like, you know, uh, I saw it. Boop, boop, boop. I'm sorry. I'm having an ADD week. So that's why my brain is a little scattered. But so to see on my news feeds, uh, discussions of, and, and people being like, oh, uh, I wish she had done it this way. I wish she had done this. I wish she'd been more aggressive. You know, that's a big, that's a big thing that, uh, yeah. liberals, fellow liberals will give liberals advice is like, we need to stop being so, you know, bending over. We need to like show strength. We need to like, you know, like rise to the, to the often stubborn challenge that's being uh, brought to, to the situation and to, to see people like say that and to, to know the little bit that I do about like the black woman's life and, and the, all those, the way those stereotypes, like if you, any politician has to walk a fine line in how they interact with people, any mm-hmm. one, but I can only imagine how much bs a black woman has to do because the second that they get aggressive or, you know the, the second that they get strong people take it as aggressive yeah yeah um <laughs> see i even said the second they get aggressive like that my first thought was the second they get and like no that's not the right word right well and there's a conversation about um uh i i had a conversation with a friend about the difference between um indignant and aggressive, I believe it was, or like anger and aggression, right? So anger and indignance, indig- indignance. Wow. I, so I have some family members that will probably listen to this at some point in time indignance. and they'll be like, at some indignance, Indig- indignance, you couldn't say, couldn't. Yeah. So I, I have a particular family member in mind who I know will make fun of me for that moment, but um, indignation, let's do that because I can, I can say that word instead. Um, and obviously anytime I have moments where I have difficulty speaking, I'm like, Hey, guess what? I'm really good at my job. <laughs> Super good. But um, the anger and indignation are emotions, emotions that everybody's entitled to because people should be allowed to exist in the full spectrum of humanity. And anger and indignation are allowed but i um i actually really only started to allow myself to access the feeling of anger recently through therapy (laughs) and so because i spent so much of my life trying to be um trying trying to be what other people perceived as good and oftentimes like you said if you're a black woman like if you start to even get into the territory of anger and indignation then you're loud and aggressive aggression has to do with an action and so it's interesting when we perceive someone having an emotional experience that we determine that they're either plotting to act or they are acting Mm. you know so because a state of being Mm. is different from a state of doing but there's this assumption with certain people that when they are being they're existing in a space that they are going to do or they are doing which is not fair because other people can be there's a separation between them being and them doing um and so, so yeah, so you, so you're absolutely right. There's this fine line. I'll give you an example that happened in one of my classrooms. 
so I had a student that was perpetually coming late to class. And one day the student rocked up late to class and I clapped. And so anyone who understands black culture in the U.S. understands what I mean when I say I clapped. <laughs> so I physically clapped and hopefully this is not, I apologize if it's aggressive to the ears. See, I'm doing something, right? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I was like, I'm just going to say student. I'm not going to say their name. But I was like, student, you came late. <laughs> we started 15 minutes ago. And so, and I said it, it like that and it was kind of humorous. Like people, I thought it, I thought it was humorous. And like my co-instructor thought it was humorous, but the students were stunned. They were just kind of like, and I, I and what, what is the general racial makeup of the class? Um, so I actually had, um, because of the class, um, I actually had a pretty great, um, mix of diversity. I know we're having an ambulance moment. I guess the moment the ambulance went by. Sweet. Anyway. Um, so I was teaching my first year experience class, Pop, Lock, and Lindy Hop. And I, my co-instructor was also, also identifies as Black or African-American. And so this was one of the few classes at Baldwin-Wallace that had an instructing team that was entirely from a diverse perspective. And so our student, our racial makeup was probably about 50% maybe of students of color. So many students understood what clapping means culturally. So I, I did that. Everybody was stunned. Everybody kind of looked at me for a second. And because we had built a rapport, this was about halfway through the semester, um, one of the students kind of just chimed in and was like, so you know when females clap, usually that's not they're just like they're all thinking about their moms and like oh no my mom is about to smack me upside the head or something like there's like they're like oh no and so everybody everyone had interpreted that as an act of aggression and it it was really it was interesting it was yeah, it was right it was interesting i was like whoa okay you all know me you know i'm super chill and you know, I'm just, I'm using one of my cultural pieces to like bring this sheep that is going astray. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, gently guiding them back <laughs> into the fold. Like that's what I'm trying to do desperately in this moment. And so I'm using humor to do that, but then it was misinterpreted. Anyway, it ended up being fine. Um, you know, I... I caught myself midway through clapping through a sentence one time, just because that was my emotional state at the time. Yeah. And, uh, and it was the first time and I, and it's really weird to start off clapping confidently and then to be like, I should not be doing this. And then to stop clapping halfway through, like, <laughs> like I should not be doing this right now. And <laughs> like, I just caught myself, let's see, I, I think that uh, my theory, I'm gonna throw this at you and this might be a horrible theory. Uh, I think it's, I don't know. I think it, so my theory that I just came up with, so it's like five seconds old <laughs> is that, uh, and this is based on some of the things that I've read before. And it really, it really rings true for me is this idea that, um, one of the things that black American culture just does so well is it creates satisfying, uh, catharsis. Like really sad, like, so the idea of that, that when you clap, when you, when you're really feeling that emotion and you're saying it with the words, like, it's just such a satisfying way of like expressing that moment. And, you know, this is like, this goes back to all American music, in my opinion, like, you know, the way that a swing rhythm feels, you know, the way that hip hop rhythm feels like there's something so satisfying about it that like. That's why you want to move to it. That's why you want to grow to it, groove to it. That's why I think a lot of people stick around when they're doing swing dancing is because swing dancing is such a satisfying experience to have. And, uh, yeah. 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 And I, I think like when we talk about ownership of 
swing dancing and um, people wanting to exist in spaces, in, in swing dance spaces that um, because there are aspects, like I think you've actually told me this before, you're like many of the greatest aspects of American culture come from Black American culture. Absolutely. And, and the thing that is an absolute atrocity is that we're not willing to acknowledge that fact. Yes. And it's particular. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Uh, the. Wah, 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 wah. Yeah, see, I'm having one of those days where my thoughts cannot stay in my face. It's it is all good. I I hear you. It's this has been a week, man. There was um there's a meme that was going around and it was like these are the decades in which I've lived. It's like 1980s, 1990s, 2000, 2010s, early 2020, January <laughs> to March 2020. <laughs> like <laughs> April may 2020 <laughs> like it's just it is right now october 2020 is like a very like this is like a decade in and of itself you got yeah, it? well, uh, well actually this this is actually going back to the satisfy the satisfaction thing um uh, in the documentary uh on minstrelsy that the name of it is not the official name of the documentary is not coming to my head right now but um, it's is it isn't it um is it ethnic notions yes the ethnic notion, yes, and ethnic notions. The speaker said one of those things where I had to pause it and like go into a room and just sit with myself and think for a while. <laughs> uh, and that was that um, white people have always gotten catharsis out of Black American uh, artistic uh, endeavors because white people were so repressed from being able to express emotions they're so repressed from being able to like get up and dance they're so express so repressed Did i say expressed they're not expressed they're <laughs> they're so repressed from you know so many things about what it means to be a, a white person in a european american society yeah. um and that was something that really struck a chord with me because i grew up in uh by no means i'm just gonna yeah, it's all I'm gonna right. let someone take over for a second while I mute the microphone. Yeah, so I, I, I think I, I, I totally hear where you're coming from. I, um, first of all, I'm gonna repeat the name of that documentary, Ethnic Notions. Please look out for that. Um, we've dropped a couple pieces of knowledge in terms of resources, so feel free to review the podcast to hear. Monsell Durden is another person who is a great historian. Um, an educator. And so Bobby and I love working and listening to him, um, working with him and listening to him. So it is, it is interesting how the majority population uh, in the U.S. has kind of grabbed onto these elements of Black American culture, African American culture, um, and so if you feel some sort of pushback as people talk about appropriation versus appreciation. Um, and if you hear from black voices that uh, white people need to engage in some reflection as they interact with black things, as we were talking about with clothes, um, it's because many things that and many things that come from black American culture have just been subsumed with no acknowledgement that they are black American. And so the thing that brings us here today, <laughs> we, we're gathered here today. <laughs> the thing that brings us here today is the fact that many people, if you were listening to this and you've never swing danced before in your life, who swing dances? Imagine, conjure an image in your mind. What image comes to mind when you think about swing dancing? Who swing dances? That image looks very different, probably, from the people who actually originated the dance. And that is like the quintessential example of what we're talking about. Anyway, Bobby, um, yeah, your thoughts? I, I think that was a beautiful summation of the conversation that we've had so far. And obviously, we've touched upon like 20 different topics. You know, we've dipped in like five feet deep in them to and pulled out and jump into a new topic. Obviously, <laughs> this is going to be something we're going to talk about a lot uh, more throughout these episodes and stuff. 
but I'm really excited. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm excited too. Thanks for hanging in and listening to us. And we love discussing this. And as Bobby said, um, we are not purporting to be perfect at all. Nope. We're, we're not. We're on a journey. And so we're trying to do our due diligence in um, engaging in candid discussion where we are right now. And where we are right now is going to be different from where we'll be in three months, six months, et cetera. Um, the amount of learning that I have gone through since the beginning of 2020 is immense. Um, and and so I we're, we would hope that the things that we say spark discussion and also encourage you to research and find yes. answers for yourself. Um, so yeah, so so thanks for listening to us. Thank you for listening to our imperfect journey. Uh, we appreciate you all. <laughs>